afternoon. Thank you for coming to a talk. Um, so a really brief outline uh, of what I'll be talking about. Uh, I'm going to start with just an overview of uh, radiocarbon and stabilite isotope analysis. Uh, beef a brief background on uh, how and why the research was begun and uh, the impacts that it can have on our future research, ongoing research, uh, and ways that it can, it can be tied into a lot of uh, projects that Chris and I have uh, been working on. Uh, and then I'll, I'll end uh, by going over uh, the results from this preliminary study of uh, nine features from three sites. Um, and if you have questions during the talk, please feel free to stop me and ask. <clears throat> so, uh, radiocarbon analysis uh, uh, starts with having radiocarbon produced. Uh, this begins in the upper atmosphere uh, with cosmic radiation bombarding the upper atmosphere, creating neutrons. Uh, uh, a, a nitrogen-14 atom uh, captures one of these neutrons, pops a proton uh, out of place, and because now that atom only has six protons, uh, it becomes uh, a carbon atom, but because it has uh, six protons and eight neutrons, it uh, is carbon-14. Uh, carbon-14 uh, gets incorporated into tissues of living uh, animals and plants, uh, just like all other carbon molecules. Uh, we are pri primarily carbon-based uh, organisms. Um, then the organism will die, uh, and the clock starts to tick, essentially, and the 14C will decay back into uh, 14N. Um, and that's the actual process by which uh, that all occurs. So again, nitrogen, uh, neutron, uh, pops out a proton, becomes uh, carbon, uh, and when it decays by beta decay, uh, the carbon-14 becomes uh, nitrogen, uh, and you lose uh, uh, electron, uh, uh, electron neutrino. So uh, the, the dating of uh, radiocarbon samples is predicated on the fact that it decays at a known rate uh, that, that is steady. Um, so a half life's the time necessary for half of the, the content of uh, that, that atom to decay away. Uh, so after two laf half lives, you get a quarter of the original amount. After three, you get an eighth. And by the time that you get to 57,000 years, uh, you have less than 0.1% of the original 14C remaining in, in your sample. Uh, and so this is where that detection limit comes in as that uh, past that amount, uh, we, we can't accurately uh, measure the amount of uh, carbon-14 with the current uh, set of technology. <clears throat> so uh, radiocarbon dates uh, must be calibrated. Uh, unlike Libby thought uh, originally when he first discovered the technique, uh, back in the 1950s, radiocarbon production in the upper atmosphere isn't constant. Uh, it varies as cosmic radiation energies vary, uh, and even sometimes solar uh, energies can, can cause spikes in the radiocarbon curve. Um, this figure is just a nice pretty figure from Manning et al. Uh, from uh, last year, uh, which demonstrates uh, differences between a local uh, slash regional uh, calibration curve uh, and, and their own calibration curve that they, uh, so the local regional uh, calibration curve is the one that they created, uh, and then again, uh, variation between that and the typical NCAL uh, 13, which is for the northern hemisphere, and the SH Cal 13, uh, which is for the southern hemisphere. <clears throat> so we defined before present at uh, 80, 1950, and the reason for that is atmospheric nuclear weapons tests uh, cause a really large spike uh, in radiocarbon production in the upper atmosphere. Um, and so that's, that's just a nice anthropogenic boundary that we use to, to distinguish uh, before present and after present. Uh, and this is just, you've probably seen tons of these uh, before, but um, it took me a very long time to kind of start to actually realize how, how they, these calibration uh, functions work. So blue lines, calibration curve, gray is your probability density function of likelihoods, and then uh, the red is the uh, radiocarbon years before present determination, and it's just a normal distribution uh, with the plus or minus from, from the, the measurement standard deviation. So this isn't, actual, this isn't actually a, a real uh, plus or minus of, of age. This is actually just a plus or minus on the 
measurement of the radiocarbon years before present determination. So the actual uh, topic of the talk uh, is the radiocarbon reservoirs. Um, and radiocarbon reservoirs can exist uh, in a number of different systems. Uh, I'm specifically talking about aquatic and even more specifically talking about freshwater. Uh, but marine radiocarbon reservoirs have been known since probably within the decade after the technique was first uh, developed. Um, and you can also uh, see reservoirs uh, in geological and geologic uh, settings as well. So uh, Iceland is a good example of, of um, underground, um, I believe it's uh, underground uh, water deposits uh, that, that can affect and have, have uh, reservoir ages. Uh, and then can you transfer those those reservoirs uh, onto uh, consumers or, or other uh, systems. So reservoirs are essentially just when the activity of a system, in this case fresh water, uh, doesn't match the activity of the atmosphere. Uh, and it occurs for a number of, of reasons. Soil erosion is one, decomposition of organic remains in, in the water body, uh, and then dissolution of carbonate uh, sediments and, and rocks. Uh, in, in the water as well. And there's a lot of factors that go into uh, right, the magnitude and how much uh, uh, holding capacity a water body can have uh, for dissolved inorganic carbonate, which is the, the primary uh, component of the, the last one, the dissolution of carbonate rocks and sediments. Uh, so aquatic plants and animals uh, will uptake this old carbon, uh, just because it is carbon, so it'll get incorporated uh, into uh, their skeletal structures, into their tissues, uh, and if you are eating a fish that has uh, a reservoir, uh, has, has old carbon uh, in its tissues, then you, by, by proxy, take up uh, that old carbon uh, into your tissues as well. So I'm going to uh, switch really briefly into to carbon isotopes in the environment. Um, just just as some of, of the data I'll be showing uh, later from the, the results. Uh, includes carbon isotopes and it's kind of uh, handy to sort of have a, a reference frame uh, for what the values kind of mean. Uh, so in the environment there are three primary photosynth uh, photosynthetic pathways that plants use. Uh, there's C3, C4, or CAM. Uh, C3 is the primary uh, uh, pathway. C4 uh, is a, an evolutionary uh, branch off that's uh, commonly found in, in arid and, and uh, uh, water stress hot regions, uh, while cam plants are a, another offshoot um, of this as well uh, that are really specifically uh, uh, for hot arid regions. Cactuses are another type of cam plant, pineapples uh, a second. So they incorporate CO2 differently. Um, C3 plants are much more passive in the way that they take uh, CO2 from the atmosphere into uh, their stoma and, and into the, their systems, while um, C4 plants uh, are much more active. They have basically biomolecular pumps that, that suck up the CO2, so they, they don't discriminate against uh, heavier carbon uh, in the same way uh, that C3 uh, photosynthesizing plants do. So C3 plants have more negative D13C values uh, than C4 plants. And so down here real quick, negative uh, 26.5 is the agreed upon averaged uh, in member of, of C3 plants. Uh, C4 plants uh, typically average negative 10, negative 12 per mil. Uh, and CAM plants uh, sit in between that negative 14, negative 20. <coughs> So uh, another part, uh, another isotope that I'll be showing along with the, the radiocarbon results uh, here in a little bit uh, are nitrogen isotopes. Uh, and so uh, nitrogen isotopes uh, enter the food web uh, from plants typically to begin with. Uh, there's, there's processes below that in, in how uh, plants incorporate nitrogen into their tissues. Uh, and a lot of that also has to do with aridity and, and heat stress. Uh, as you increase aridity and heat stress, you increase nitrogen isotope values. Uh, but for a temperate area uh, like the American bottom, like Illinois, uh, typical plant values are going to be plus or plus uh, three per mil. Uh, uh, if you have things like uh, legumes, which are nitrogen fixing, they have uh, slightly lower nitrogen values uh, than than uh, non-nitrogen fixing plants. So uh, this is like a nice idealized uh, sort of food web. Uh, You've got your plants, your grasses. The rabbit will 
uh, eat, eat the grasses, and it'll be spaced uh, from them by uh, about three to five per mil. Uh, so essentially that just means that uh, if your grasses are, are three per mil, uh, your rabbit would be probably more like six to, to uh, eight, uh, probably six to, to seven per mil. Uh, same thing with deer. So as the wolf eats the rabbit, then it's spaced from uh, the rabbit by, again, three per mil here, and, and that cycles are sort of uh, continues onward. And then each step you increase the, the nitrogen uh, isotope values by three to five percent. So carnivores at the very top of the food uh, web will have uh, the highest 15 in values. Um, uh, and marine and freshwater systems uh, will have typically much larger, uh, taller food webs. So you can get uh, nitrogen isotope, val uh, isotope values of uh, plus 16 here they're showing. Um, but you can also get up to plus 20 uh, around that range uh, in marine systems. Um, freshwater aquatic systems aren't typically as, as tall, as large as marine, so you don't get as high as nitrogen isotope values, um, but you still have a much uh, larger uh, food web than you would for terrestrial systems. Yeah. So, so the nit nitrogen isotope is expressed as a positive. It's not, a, it's not expressed as a negative number. Like you can get negative numbers. But uh, I mean, it's, it, uh, like a plus eight means a high, high nitrogen, whereas a minus four would be a high car carbon carbon. I mean, they're, they're Right, well, because you're, you're both moving in the I same direction. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm just clarifying the way that they're... So, yeah, I, I should... see them so people right. understand that um, it's not... Yeah, I should... not I, directly comparable. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I'll also note, so the, the reason that you, you have that is because where the zero points on the scales are, right? So these are, these are normalized uh, two specific scales. So nitrogen is normalized uh, where the zero point is the isotopic composition of 15 in over 14 in uh, in the atmosphere. So whatever that ratio is of, of 15 nitrogen to 14 nitrogen, that's the zero point. Uh, for carbon isotope values, it's, a, uh, it's called VPDB, which stands for VPD development, uh, which is a, I believe, limestone formation that was off the coast of, of North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, so you get the same sort of idea where the, the, the ratio of 13C to 12C uh, in that, that uh, 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 geologic sediment, right, is the zero point. So in, in this basically is just that you have uh, more 15 in in these samples or in, in these uh, these individuals than you do in the, the uh, night or in the atmosphere and for the carbon you have less 13 C in the individual than you do uh, in that sediment but I mean this can be negative or excuse me uh, d 13 C values can be positive uh, especially uh, in ruminants so uh, cows uh, which uh, undergo uh, a lot more methanogenesis, uh, you'll, you'll have positive uh, carbon values, uh, especially in like India, you can see like plus four uh, so for four, D13C4. that means they have tons of that, right? mm -hmm. inordinately large quantity of carbon-14. Yep, exactly, yeah. And, and again, there's, there's, there's ecological right, effects yeah. going, right? Again, aridity, heat stress, right. right? All these sort of things can, right. can play with these, these values. So uh, another part of, of this study that I, I don't really make as much mention of uh, in this presentation, but another part of it is uh, developing a better baseline value for what our isotopic food web looks like. Um, and that will do immense amounts of help for um, uh, interpretation of the stable isotope values that we have. Uh, already run. Okay. So I'm not going to do uh, dietary construction specifically uh, in this presentation or, uh, or talk about it very much, uh, but a lot of this work has implications for dietary reconstruction and interpretation, uh, so I wanted to talk, uh, uh, touch on the topic briefly. Uh, so dietary reconstruction is predicated on the idea that you are what you eat, plus or minus a little bit. Um, so there are fractionations or spacings uh, that I kind of briefly talked about in the, the previous slide. So this is when the original ratio uh, of the isotopes are changed by some, some processes. Uh, so uh, collagen to, to diet uh, is negative <coughs> 0.1 per mil. So your collagen values will be uh, uh, 
negative or will be minus 1.5 per mil from uh, what your your dietary protein is. Uh, while appetite or carbonate uh, to diet is negative 9.4. This, this is essentially, so this, this uh, graph is uh, the range of values that you'll see uh, in a variety of, of food niches. Um, and so you essentially you'll, you'll be uh, uh, offset from, from whatever value of what you're consuming is uh, by, by those amounts. So it's important to, to understand uh, that when you have a stable isotope value from uh, a bone of a consumer that it doesn't just go directly onto, it doesn't map directly uh, to one of these these positions. You have to, to shift it uh, so that it actually would line up to what it was consuming. So uh, this project began in early 2017 uh, after discussions uh, with uh, Tim and, and Stan Ambrose uh, about the possibility of radiocarbon reservoir effects in freshwater systems uh, in the American bottom and uh, what effect this would have on the uh, bone collagen dates uh, that we have uh, for the American bottom, uh, where we have uh, 100 bone collagen dates from the American bottom alone and what, probably 300, 400 bone collagen dates spread out throughout the state. Um, so we have, we have a, a, a large data set of bone collagen dates uh, that um, this, this consideration needs to, to at least be addressed uh, so that we can understand the, the magnitude of it, if, if there is a radiocarbon reservoir, uh, and if, if there is one, how large it, it is, uh, and how much uh, our dates may need to be corrected by uh, to, to account for this, this offset. Um, and, and as always, accurate and precise dates are, are necessary to reconstruct complex cultural processes. Uh, for, for our project, uh, uh, specifically the, the most direct uh, impact is on the intensification of maize agriculture, uh, which relies in part, uh, the timing of it relies in part on the bone collagen and carbonate uh, stabilized isotope uh, results that we've generated over the past 20 some odd years, um, and, and as well the, the radiocarbon AMS dates uh, off of that bone collagen. So uh, something else to consider with reservoir effects is it's not just bone collagen. Residues from cooking uh, pottery would also be affected uh, if aquatic resources are prepared in them in a large enough uh, uh, volume. Um, and, and as well, uh, so this is actually, the, again, talking about the, the baseline, the increased understanding of, of aquatic consumption through nitrogen isotopes. So uh, because there should be separation or, or offsets between the various uh, trophic levels uh, within a, a food web, uh, we should be able to uh, quantify uh, with you know, some plus or minus uh, error, right, the, the amount of aquatic consumption uh, that uh, Mississippian, Terminal Lake Woodland, Lake Woodland, and so on, uh, individuals were consuming. Uh, and that plays into being able to do uh, what I would call a calibrated correction uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. So our, our primary research questions for this pilot project was, can we identify REEs uh, within freshwater systems in American Bottom uh, using paired terrestrial and aquatic samples? Um, if an RRE exists, uh, can we identify any correlated trends with regards to nitrogen or carbon isotopes? And if those trends exist, uh, can they be used to apply a correction uh, to uh, collagen radiocarbon dates uh, calibrated by the stable light isotopes? So uh, the way that we went about determining whether or not there uh, or to identify radiocarbon reservoir effects uh, was by using paraterrestrial and aquatic bone uh, from associated with secured feature contexts. So essentially, uh, we, and, and there's also uh, uh, botanical samples, charred botanical samples as well uh, included in that. So you have uh, a feature and you have a terrestrial bone that should have a terrestrial uh, radiocarbon uh, atmospheric content, right? It should be in equilibrium with the, the radiocarbon concentration in the atmosphere. And then you have your aquatic bone, and what you're really testing is whether or not the aquatic bone matches with the terrestrial bone or with the, the charred botanical samples, right? Uh, and you want them to be from the same context, uh, right, so that you, you know that they're associated and that they should be from, from the same time period. Um, so extracted collagen from the terrestrial samples and the aquatic samples 
uh, as well as doing stable anisotope and elemental analysis to make sure that the collagen that we were uh, submitting for dating was a, a good quality, good preservation. Um, the hypothesis again on this is that the REEs, the aquatic samples with an REE will be older than the terrestrial sample. Uh, and that uh, the other byproduct of that is that if consumers are eating aquatic samples with radiocarbon reservoir effects uh, present, then they themselves should also uh, have radiocarbon reservoir effect and have an older apparent age than their actual true age. So uh, we sampled from three sites, uh, the Cunningham site, uh, where we sampled six features and 17 uh, samples in total. Halliday site, uh, two features, uh, six samples total. Uh, and then the, the Pfeffer site, uh, which was only one feature in three samples. So these are uh, calibrated uh, probability density functions of, of the various uh, dates uh, from all of the features. So each graph is one feature. So uh, uh, you can see when they line up really clearly uh, that there's either a very, very small radiocarbon reservoir effect or there, isn't, there probably really isn't one uh, at all in, in that fish. Uh, but in the case of Cunningham feature 36, there's a bone, uh, bowfin that we, we uh, ran, which is offset by uh, what, about 300-ish years. Uh, again, feature 45, uh, no radiocarbon reservoir effect present. In, in that fish, uh, but for 46 there was, and it was actually a rather large one uh, of about uh, 700 years. And uh, again, sort of similar pattern. Uh, you can see again, no, no reservoir effect, reservoir effect. Um, uh, if there is one here on the Halliday feature four, it's very, very slight. Uh, and then here's uh, the Pfeffer one. So there was actually two Hallidays, uh, but I cut one out just for, for spacing and also because uh, that, the bone collagen from the aquatic sample uh, was kind of right at the limits of our quality controls uh, and, and came back with a date that was younger than the rest of the samples in that feature. Uh, and it's likely that that sample just wasn't as well preserved as it should have been. Uh, the one interesting thing uh, that I'll note from Pfeffer that's really cool uh, is, is that the uh, dog sample that we ran, so there is a, a reservoir effect present uh, in the uh, aquatic sample, the buffalo fish, uh, but the canine sample is just barely not lining up with uh, the terrestrial white-tailed deer sample. Um, and it, to me, would suggest that, it, that this canine is eating uh, radiocarbon, or is eating reservoir-affected aquatic samples, and that's why that they're, they're just slightly offset uh, from, from this, this deer. Assuming again that the, the feature context really is truly actually secure here. So, yeah. So what for that canid that last one that you were looking at? Yeah. What percent of the diet would would you need to have that offset? So our average uh, freshwater radiocarbon reservoir offset is about 450 years. So that offsets, you know, from, from the actual middle of this to the middle of that's what, I think about 40, 50 years, something like that, right? So with, with an average radiocarbon reservoir offset for all the samples that we've run, uh, you'd need 10, 15% aquatic consumption, right? Um, the, the one- It's not as hot, it's not really that terribly hot. No, 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 it's not, right. Because again, the larger the magnitude of the effect uh, of the reservoir offsets are, right, the smaller amount that you need to consume, uh, right, for for right to have your offset on the consumer be larger, right. Um, the the one caveat is again, the other, as you can tell, is that not all of these samples have reservoir offsets. So this is still something I'm kind of working through, which is uh, again, we haven't we're we're thinking about and considering the calibration and the correction steps. Um, but I would like to, to collect more data and run more samples uh, before I, I really attempt something. Um, so again, our, our total offset right average is 450 some odd years. But only four out of the nine features actually have reservoir offsets. So should that, like again, how to, how to account for, for that uh, when doing these calibrations and corrections is, is still something I'm, I'm considering and thinking about. So, uh, as I said, four of the, the nine features yielded fish uh, with radiocarbon reservoir uh, offsets, RROs. 
Um, here's just a, a really quick uh, chart of them, and I've highlighted in yellow uh, the ones uh, that had a, a significant offset that was uh, greater than 100 years. So you can see our greatest is about 700 years, and our least is about 330 years. Uh, and again, yeah, the average is 464 plus or minus 167 years, uh, radiocarbon years, right? So this is, so the, the previous graph here, these are all calibrated dates, uh, but this difference here is actually just based on taking radiocarbon years uh, before present minus radiocarbon years before, before present. Um, and and uh, something that will be a little bit more obvious in the next graph that I show, uh, but that I want to point out now is that uh, previous studies on radiocarbon reservoir effects in Europe and Siberia uh, have found, uh, again, a trend with nitrogen isotope ratio. So as you increase the nitrogen isotope ratio, ratio the, the magnitude of your offset, right, from, from actual, uh, from apparent age to true age gets larger. Um, in the aquatic samples that we have, that doesn't seem to hold true, uh, right? The greatest uh, offset that we have at 700 years is one of the, I think it's second lowest, yes, yeah, second lowest nitrogen isotope ratio. So nitrogen isotope ratios aren't, aren't going to be uh, unfortunately directly correlated to reservoir offsets, um, which complicates doing corrections. So this is the graph that I was talking about, uh, and again you can see really clearly, so this is decreasing trophic level uh, that way, right? Uh, increasing trophic level this way. So this fish here, this bass, is probably eating, you know, at the very least, this buffalo fish here, and maybe he's eating, you know, a bowfin, right? But again, like, not directly, but I mean, of, of the same trophic level, right? Uh, and I've kind of divided these into sort of three, three sort of categories that I'm calling uh, primary aquatic consumers, secondary aquatic consumers in here, and then the fish that are uh, plus, plus 10, plus 11 uh, for their D15 in values, uh, I'm calling uh, a, a tertiary, right, uh, aquatic consumers. So there isn't a nitrogen isotope ratio trend, correlated trend, but there appears to be one with uh, carbon isotope values. And so this is, this is really curious. So this is the Halliday sample uh, that we, we dropped out because it's, it's got a, a weight percent carbon uh, less than 25% just below it, uh, and our cutoff is at 25% uh, for, for collagen uh, as a measure of preservation. Uh, so there is a correlated trend uh, with carbon. Uh, obviously, it's, it's not super strong because it's only uh, what, eight samples. Um, but uh, <clears throat> what's curious about what we found is uh, what another researcher, Hart et al., uh, in 2018 found. So this is, uh, this is, uh, oops. So this one is on, on bone collagen, and Hart's is on actually fish, fish muscle tissue. Uh, but he, he observes a very similar sort of trend, though the magnitude of, of his offsets aren't as large as ours are. Uh, but he sees, again, a similar trend that uh, uh, depleting uh, 13C increases uh, the offset, uh, apparent offset, on, on aquatic uh, samples. Um, something of importance to note, both here and, and in, in this graph, is that so colors are species and their species do not line up with each other in either nitrogen isotope ratios or, or in carbon isotope ratios. So, species, so radiocarbon reservoir offsets are, are variable within species uh, and between species. Uh, 13C yeah, correlates, um, and, and again, this trend is, uh, this is from upstate New York. So, oops. So uh, increasing the number of sample sizes from uh, woodland and Mississippian sites is going to be the next step uh, in this research. Uh, radiocarbon reservoir effects can, can vary uh, temporally and spatially, so it's important to actually be testing uh, the time period where we are most uh, interested in uh, doing corrections. Um, the other part of this is that uh, the spatial part is that resource exploitation zones uh, likely encompass different aquatic systems. Uh, and again, aquatic, these systems will change over time. Uh, streams will come in, lakes will, will dry up. Uh, so, so it's important to be testing uh, each, each time period that you're interested in. 
Um, it'd be really interesting to be able to identify where the uh, radiocarbon reservoir effects are actually located on, on the landscape. Uh, if they're confined to primarily rivers or if they're lakes or, or again, uh, where these fish are coming out of uh, that have radiocarbon reservoir effects. Um, uh, a part of this that kind of goes along with it all is again expanding our stable isotope food web study. Uh, and again, this is because we need to be able, if we ever hope to be able to do corrections of, of our radiocarbon dates, uh, we need to know how much aquatic fish they're consuming. Um, and, and again, even though there isn't a, a direct tie with nitrogen isotope ratios uh, in, in the correlation or a correlation between nitrogen isotope ratios and radiocarbon reservoir effects, um, having a percentage of aquatic consumed will allow us to, to again, have a, a calibrated way of applying a correction uh, rather than just saying, oh, well, you know, the, the magnitude of it's, you know, 450 years and we'll just apply that to everything because that, that's obviously not uh, truly how that works. Um, and, and then compound-specific uh, radiocarbon analysis of amino acids, but also just uh, compound-specific uh, analysis, uh, a stable, stable light isotope analysis of amino acids uh, is very much where the, the field is, is getting pushed uh, right now. Uh, and it, it's uh, very likely uh, we'll be able to help distinguish uh, the, the aquatic consumption uh, along with nitrogen isotope ratios. Um, so, yeah. Thank you.